Okay, welcome everybody. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dan Hooper, um, who will be talking to us about one of the many areas that uh, he's looked at uh, um, over his uh, august career. Um, Dan did his original uh, PhD with Francis uh, Halzen of sort of Ice Cube fame, um, Madison, uh, Wisconsin. He uh, he then went on to postdoc with um, another couple of sort of august names in our, you know, uh, particle cosmology: the uh, Sabir Sarkir and also uh, Joe Silk at Oxford. Um, he then uh, went on to Fermilab, uh, where he is now, uh, but started originally as a David Schramm fellow, um, became staff scientist, and is now a senior uh, scientist at Fermilab, uh, head and the head of the theoretical astrophysics. Uh, uh, a group at uh, Fermilab. He's also a uh, professor of uh, astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago. So it, it does uh, well. It does give me great pleasure to see uh, uh, Dan here. I know a number of you have had interaction interactions with him. You'll know just uh, what a live wire he is. So Dan, thanks so much for uh, uh, being here, and over to you. <laughs> So I, I know that I'm doing something either very wrong or something very right when Rick Gateskill calls you a live wire. Um, <laughs> so um, it's my pleasure to be here at Brown University. Uh, I have a lot of uh, people I consider friends and uh, close colleagues here, so it's, it's a pleasure to visit. Um, and I met a couple of people today that I didn't know prior um, that I, I've uh, really enjoyed my interactions with. Uh, lunch with the grad students was particularly fun. Um, I've noticed I have a typo on my very first slide, so uh, I'm hoping that I'll get, get that to a minimum, but uh, anyway. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the name of the talk, what I'm trying to convey here. So the fact is, I can wake up on a random day and think to myself, this WIMP hypothesis that I spent you know, so many of my waking hours contemplating over the last you know, 15 years or something, it's beaten and bruised and ugly now. Like these experiments should have seen it. Why am I working on this? And I, I feel despondent. And then, you know, the next, you know, day or two or something, I can wake up and think to myself, you know, the WIMP hypothesis is really compelling. And those constraints really aren't that severe. There's nothing wrong with them. Well, yeah, probably dark matter is made up of WIMPs. So I've decided that I'm going to write kind of a, uh, uh, a talk in which I try to explain both of those perspectives. I don't try to convince you which one to take most seriously, because uh, frankly, I don't know. Um, every time I give the talks a little bit different, but um, the idea is, is that we're at a, at a point now where we've tested a lot of WIMP ideas, um, and we're testing many others. And uh, you know, so I'm going to describe the status of that, the, the considerations that go into all these lines of thinking, and maybe you'll get a, a better feeling by the end of the talk where, where things stand. All right. So I could have chosen many different axes uh, when describing various WIMP models, or dark matter models, I should say. But here I'm going to choose to do it in terms of mass of the particle or the, the, the constituents that make up the dark matter. Um, there are ends to this, even though it spans 90 orders of magnitude. Uh, but there is a minimum at 10 to the minus 22 EV. I, if it were lighter than that, its Compton wavelength couldn't fit in dwarf galaxies. And we know there's dark matter in dwarf galaxies, so it can't be lighter than that. And then we can go all the way up to about 100 solar masses. These would be black holes. Um, if we're any heavier than that, um, the particulates, the, these 100 solar mass things, wouldn't be able to form dwarf galaxy halos and stuff. So um, we really do have a bookends to this, although it's a huge bookcase, all right? It extends 90 orders of magnitude. Um, along this line, there are many interesting benchmarks. Way down in the light end are uh, particles we call axions. Um, these are not WIMPs. These are something else. Uh, these are, are all, all, uh, extremely light particles that were not, never in equilibrium in the early universe, but instead were produced through another mechanism called misalignment production. They're very well motivated, and people are actively looking for them. But I'm not really going to talk about them today. On the other extreme are primordial black holes. So these would be black holes that, for some reason we don't really understand, were formed in copious quantities in the Big Bang. Um, they could be even in the LIGO mass range, where we're seeing these, these black hole-black hole mergers. 
Um, probably the constraints say that all the dark matter is not made up of this stuff, but maybe 10% or something could be. That's still a logical possibility. Down here is another important benchmark, uh, sterile neutrinos. This is a really active uh, line, uh, area of investigation. There's only a sliver of parameter space left, but in that parameter space, you cover a region where you might be, be able to generate this observed 3.5 keV line. So that's generated a lot of interest. I won't talk about that much today, though, at all. Instead, I'm going to focus on this range, which I call uh, the, the range in which we're talking about dark matter in the form of a, a WIMP, or what I'm going to call the classical WIMP roughly in the 10 MeV to 100 TeV range. So historically, a huge fraction of the, of the studies that have been done in dark matter have focused on this kind of dark matter candidate, what I'm going to call the classical WIMP. Um, this goes back to the 60s. So uh, Gerstein and Zeldovich in 66 were talking about massive standard model neutrinos as dark matter. They didn't use the word dark matter because you know, no one was talking about dark matter back then. But they were talking about these things being produced in the Big Bang and affecting cosmology. Okay? Um, it was, was independently discovered in the West in 1972 by Kausick and McClellan and later by Marx, Hudd, and Weinberg and all these guys in the 70s. Um, so it started out talking about neutrinos, known particles, imagining that they had GeV scale masses. But then later, people started to talk about other things, like supersymmetric relics, and then eventually other classes of particles, all of which shared some common features. Namely, they had GeV or even TeV scale masses, and they had weak scale interactions. This was the kind of foundation for, for WIMPs as we know them. Um, and there was this, this incredible argument about why these things were generically good dark matter candidates called uh, the WIMP miracle. And I'll talk a little bit about that next. So let's make this argument as general as we possibly can. So I'm not talking about any specific kind of particle here. I'm not assuming any kind of particle physics framework. I'm only making two assumptions. I'm saying, first of all, uh, the universe in, 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 a, in its first seconds or minutes or fraction of a second behaved more or less like we think it did. If you filled it with radiation and just let it expand according to general relativity, we assume that's what happened. Okay? We don't really know this, but let's just assume it's true, and it probably is. And second, let's assume that whatever the dark matter is, at some point it was in thermal equilibrium with the bath of all the particles that exist in the Big Bang. Again, this is a very reasonable argument. If it has anything even extremely feeble interactions with the standard model, this will be true. So if it's not true, it means it doesn't interact with the standard model at all. Okay? So if these two things are true, we can, we can draw some very sweeping conclusions. First of all, the abundance of dark matter that survives the Big Bang, this, that, that, that emerges out of the hot Big Bang, depends directly on the dark matter's mass and its interactions or couplings with the standard model. So if you have a dark matter particle with small couplings to the standard model, it will tend to exceed the measured dark matter abundance. The bigger the couplings are, the less the dark matter survives. So um, from these two things, you, you, can, you can work out what range of masses the dark matter would have to have in order to make up the dark matter today. And it works out to about 10 MeV to 100 TeV or so. Okay? If it was heavier than this, you can't get it to annihilate enough. And if it's lighter than that, it will screw up all the predictions of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So you have now. Um, a you know, comparatively narrow range of masses to focus on. Um, and this is the range I'm talking about when I talk about WIMPs. I'm talking about something that was a thermal relic that emerged um, uh, from, the, from the Big Bang uh, through the, these sort of uh, simple interactions. So if you want to test this hypothesis, this is what I would argue is an extremely well-motivated hypothesis, there are several ways you can go about doing it. And they roughly fall under uh, three different categories, or three broad umbrellas. Uh, direct detection, indirect detection, and searches at colliders, such as a Large Hadron Collider. When I'm talking about direct detection, what I mean here is that your particle comes uh, through the Earth and to, to wherever your detector is. It strikes something in your target, maybe an atomic nucleus, and imparts a little bit of energy in the form of recoil. So this is elastic or perhaps inelastic scattering. Um, th that sort of event will yield potentially observable quantities of things like scintillation, ionization, or heat, or phonons. Um, the current state of the art in this field utilizes uh, ton or multi-ton targets of heavy nuclei, in particular xenon is the leading uh, uh, target right now. Um, these instruments are, are, are located in deep underground facilities to minimize cosmic ray backgrounds. Uh, for example, we're talking here about xenon one-ton lux and panda x, 
Um, and in the future, we're looking at things like LZ or Lux Zeppelin, as well as uh, Xenon Inton. Over the past 15 years or so, this community, the direct detection community, has improved the sensitivity of their collective experiments with an exponential rate. So it looks like Moore's law for computing, okay? Um, roughly uh, gaining a factor of two in sensitivity every 15 months or so. So you'll notice this is a linear scale of time and a logarithmic scale of cross-section sensitivity. And the fact that this line is straight means it's exponential in, uh, in growth. There are a couple of important benchmarks along this axis. Up here is the range where you would expect a generic dark matter particle to interact with nuclei if it is scatters uh, coherently through the ordinary weak force. So I mean the, the standard model Z exchange. So for example, if the dark matter were just like a big heavy neutrino, you'd expect it to fall in this range. And that was ruled out back in the 90s, okay? And then there was another important benchmark along here, around here roughly, where the dark matter interacts with the standard model through the exchange of the standard model Higgs boson. Okay, now that we know that that Higgs boson exists and knows its properties, we can nail that down a little bit. And again, we seem to have cut through that or, or you know, roughly at the, at the bottom end of that range right now. That seems to not any longer be a particularly viable hypothesis. And the progress has continued in recent years. So here are uh, some, some uh, particularly recent results uh, in the last year or so, Xeno 1 ton and uh, Panda 2, or Panda X2 and Crest 3 have all reported new results this year. In addition, I, I didn't include it, but there's a, a similar result in this from uh, the dark side experiment. So these, these experiments have really improved in sensitivity in a dramatic sense in just the last year or so. And we expect this to continue. The current constraints are shown as this, this solid black line here. That's my approximation of them. I just superimpose them on this plot. And we expect over the next decade or so, these lines to move down, approaching this boundary here, which is known as the neutrino floor. That's the, that's the sensitivity you reach when you, you reach an approximately irreducible background from neutrinos in this sort of experiment. Um, where exactly that boundary is depends on the kind of target you're using and how big it is and things like this. But at that point, you expect um, it to be very difficult to make progress. But I, I imagine over the next 10 years or so, these, these experiments will move to lower masses and to much lower cross sections, approximately saturating uh, the, the, what we call the neutrino floor. So I'll just talk very briefly, just one slide about dark matter searches at the LHC. Um, you can, easily make an entire talk about dark matter search to the LAC. Um, what I was unable to do is find a way to summarize all of the activity being done in dark matter at Atlas and CMS in just a few slides. So I decided I would just go with one and basically say very, very little. But the main point is that we haven't seen evidence of new physics at the LAC yet beyond the, the, the standard model Higgs boson. Um, for the first time, much of the weak scale, electroweak scale, um, has been explored. There are no strongly interacting particles lighter than most of a TeV. There are no electrically charged particles lighter than a few hundred GeV. And in many, for many other kind of cases, you can write down uh, new gauge bosons and things like this. You can make sweeping statements up to several TeV. This is really an amazing accomplishment. Uh, the number of different analyses and searches have been conducted is staggering. And at this point, I think it's just fair to say that although uh, we haven't seen anything, there still exists room for you know, your favorite weak scale theory. You just have to push all the masses up. Um, but I will say that most of the things that we are hoping or expecting to see in this experiment have not appeared to the surprise and frustration of uh, myself and many of my particle physics colleagues. So thirdly, I'll talk about indirect searches. This is a little bit different. So here we're looking for the annihilation products, or perhaps the decay products of the dark matter uh, out in the halo of the Milky Way or elsewhere. Um, and this is a little bit different in the sense that we have a very well-defined benchmark to search for, okay? So with, indirect or with direct detection, there are many, many orders of magnitude this scattering cross-section could have appeared at. At the LHC, there are many different channels you might have seen something in over a wide range of rates and masses. In the case of indirect searches, we have a much more well-defined benchmark. And it's based on the, the calculation of the abundance produced in the Big Bang. So in particular, if you want to get the right dark matter abundance out of the Big Bang, you need to have an annihilation cross-section of, of about this number um, at the time of freeze-out at temperatures uh, similar to the WIMPs mass. That's uh, 2 times to the minus 26 cubic centimeters per second. 
So there are various model dependent factors you could include in your theory that make the cross section in the, in the galaxy today be a little higher or a little lower than this. I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of theories or models you can write down predict that the dark matter should be annihilating with a rate that's not very different from this cross section today. Maybe a factor of a few or an order of magnitude away from this number, but it gives you a very clear benchmark. If you can, t if you can test uh, uh, theories in which ha uh, you have a cross section that's of this level or maybe a little lower, you can test the overwhelming majority of all the WIMP theories you might uh, conceive of. And that's exactly what's going on right now. A variety of strategies involving both gamma ray searches and cosmic ray searches, in particular cosmic ray antimatter searches, are testing scenarios in which uh, a WIMP annihilates with the sort of cross-section we're talking about here. So this is an example using AMS data uh, looking for signs of dark matter in the shape of the cosmic ray positron spectrum. So if the dark matter annihilates strictly to E plus E minus, which is, I will admit is a, a pretty contrived theory, but just you know, as a case example, we can rule out everything ab above this blue line. And this is where you would expect things to be for a normal generic WIMP. So that gets you up to about 200 GeV. That's a pretty serious constraint. Everything below 200 GeV we can approximately rule out in that model. Um, if you're annihilating to muons or taus, the constraints are weaker, but still interesting. The Fermi constraints are based on the observations of dwarf galaxies. These are small satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. Uh, when you observe uh, you know, several tens of these things and stack them in a, in a statistical combination, you find constraints that look kind of like this, and that rules out things up to about 50 GeV or so, at least for this uh, particular kind of annihilation mode. And then here's a similar constraint, again from AMS, but this time observing the cosmic ray antiproton spectrum, or speci more specifically the antiproton to proton ratio as a function of energy. And if you ignore that feature for the time being, the constraint's very, very stringent, going all the way up to about a TV or so, um, although this is a little bit more model dependent and assumes some things about astrophysics that I think are, are a little uh, less reliable. This feature is interesting because it, it shows that there's actually a, a three sigma excess there, and there's a little, little uh, room for a possibility that a dark matter particle might be responsible for some of the signatures there. Um, but I think, again, this is very much dictated by systematic uncertainties. I would, not, uh, I would not go around claiming discovery of that just yet. Okay, so let me give you a concrete example to show what a, a generic wimp I might pick out of a hat might look like after you consider all of these constraints. Um, so for example, let's consider a model. This is just a, 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 a one very particular case, but it's kind of a representative case, where you have a dark matter particle that interacts through the standard model Z boson. Okay, so here the dark matter is a fermion, here is a, is a scalar or vector, so spin zero, spin one, spin one half. The x-axis in each case is the mass of the dark matter, and then this is the coupling of the dark matter to the Z. Okay, so uh, LEP constraints rule out everything in the upper left corner. This is uh, the uh, E plus E minus collider from the 90s. Um, where along the solid line is where you get the right abundance in the early universe, or in this case, the dashed line, okay? And then the cur these, these uh, curved lines are the current constraints from various direct detection experiments. So you can see in the scalar case, everything is totally ruled out. Same, same in the vector case. And then in the, uh, in the fermionic case, uh, you, know, it, 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 you reach a similar conclusion. And then here, not quite, OK? So there's a little bit of space right here that you're currently not excluded. And there's even a region that goes beyond the neutrino floor. So this model, as long as the WIMP is pretty heavy, you'll never rule out with direct detection experiments. But this gives you an idea, right? So in this, and I, I think this is a fair representative example. Most of the parameter space is very, very dead. A little bit of it survives, and even a smaller part of the, the surviving part will survive into the indefinite future. So I think this is, this is when I wake up on those, those odd days of the week, and I ask myself, well, doesn't that mean the WIMP paradigm is, is more or less dead? Shouldn't I be working on something else? Aren't other things more interesting? And I'm going to argue now that no. No, the, despite these very stringent constraints, and they are very stringent, this program has been extremely successful, not in identifying what dark matter is, but in telling us an awful lot about what it's not. So despite these very stringent constraints, there are, there are many viable options. 
that I can take as a, as a WIMP model builder that will evade these constraints without any difficulty at all, without, being, without even breaking a sweat. So to give you a flavor for what some of these look like, I'm going to give you kind of a list of some, not, incomplete, but some of the model building options that one might take to build a WIMP model that is completely consistent with all of the constraints we're talking about. All of these ideas will take advantage of this common theme. So I need some sort of mechanism where these X, this is the dark matter, are allowed to annihilate into standard model particles in an efficient way. I don't want that to be suppressed. That's how I get rid of the extra dark matter in the early universe. But when I turn that diagram on its side, when I rotate it by 90 degrees, and my dark matter comes in and strikes nuclei, I need this diagram to somehow, for some reason, be suppressed. Okay, so I'm going to show you several ways, simple ways, you can go about to do that. One, and this is the oldest idea, this goes back to, I think the first paper was in 1989 or 1991 or something, by uh, Kreist and Seckel, <coughs> is you can consider co-annihilations between the dark matter and another state. So here's my dark matter particle. This is a, a diagram that you'd get in a, in a supersymmetric WIMP model. This is my WIMP, it's a neutralino, and this is something called a STAU, it's a super partner of the tau. Um, these guys are in this, this kind of picture are not very different in mass. This guy's just a little bit lighter. So they annihilate uh, not with a pair of WIMPs, but one WIMP and a, and a STAL to two standard model particles. And this works really well in the early universe, but it's not working today because there are no STALs around. So this allows you to deplete the abundance of the neutralinos in the early universe, but it doesn't allow you to efficiently scatter with nuclei. A second idea is you just, and this is very simple, Instead of annihilating to fermions, you're annihilating to WZs and Higgs bosons. This is important because there are not WZs and Higgs bosons sitting around in nuclei to scatter with. They're made of gluons and quarks. So if I want to scatter with nuclei in this model, I have to do it through these really complicated and highly suppressed loop diagrams. So here I have my WIMP, and it couples to Ws and Zs, and those Ws and Zs can couple to, to, to uh, quarks, but this is a very suppressed diagram. And these are the sorts of diagrams that could easily be below current constraints, and in some cases can even, be, be, even fall below the predictions of the neutrino floor. I can write down models, and I won't go into this in detail, but I can write down models in which the interactions are suppressed uh, by powers of either velocity or momentum, and because WIMPs are moving around in the halo at velocities of 10 to the minus 3 in units of the speed of light, this will suppress that rate by a million or a trillion, depending on the model. That's, that's plenty to, to, to hide, hide from the, uh, the models in question. I can also make the dark matter just kind of light. After all, the constraints down here are very, very weak. So I can just make the dark matter a, a GeV or a 100 MeV or something. That's actually a very easy way to hide it from current direct detection experiments. I could change the early universe a little bit. I could say, well, things weren't strictly radiation dominated in the first millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Maybe there was an uh, era of early matter domination and late time reheating or a period of, of uh, late time inflation, like a, a brief burst of expansion that happened after the dark matter froze out. These things could all change uh, the, the, the predictions we're, we're talking about here by depleting the abundance of dark matter without increasing its couplings. And the last thing on my list here are models in which the dark matter annihilates not into the standard model, but into something else within a hidden sector, something without couplings to the standard model directly, and those things are unstable, um, allowing you to deplete the abundance in the early universe without directly coupling to the standard model. These are called hidden sector models. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in detail, because this is my favorite of these options. Um, not that it's the best option, but it, it gives uh, model builders a lot of cool stuff to play with. And I think it's worth appreciating, because these, these are going to be a bigger and bigger deal, I think, in the years ahead. All right, so I'm going to hypothesize that the dark matter is one of several particle species, all of which interact with each other, but do not interact directly with the standard model. So all these particles do not have electric charge, these particles do not have color, QCD color, and they don't have weak hypercharge, so they don't talk to the Ws and Zs or Higgs bosons. Okay, so you have 
a sector of particles, maybe they have their own kind of dark charge or dark color or something like this, but they don't talk to the standard model in any direct way. So I have the standard model and all those particles here, and I have the hidden sector particles, and they're all over here. But even without any direct couplings, I can write down perfectly renormalizable interactions that we call portal couplings. They're very feeble, but they can allow particles in the hidden sector to interact with the standard model very feebly, but in a, in, a, in a significant way that allows them to be in kinetic equilibrium with each other in the early universe. So in the early universe, there are a bunch of standard model particles floating around, a bunch of hidden sector particles floating around, and basically they're allowed to stay at the same temperature as each other through these portal interactions. Okay, so the dark matter, which I'm calling X here, freezes out of thermal e equilibrium in the early universe entirely within its own hidden sector. The only way that it can even tell the standard model is there is that uh, the, the energy density in the standard model impacts how fast the universe is expanding. But other than that, it doesn't even know the standard model is there. And when it annihilates, it goes to these particles Y, which are just some other particle in the hidden sector, some unstable particle in, in the hidden sector. Those guys then uh, eventually decay. Like I said, they're unstable. And they, they decay into standard model stuff through this small portal interaction. So the annihilations are set entirely by hidden sector dynamics, but then the portal interaction allows us to get rid of the overall hidden sector abundance into standard model energy. This is attractive for a bunch of different reasons. First of all, um, because there are no direct interactions with the standard model, uh, elastic scattering rates with nuclei or direct detection rates are very, very low, highly suppressed, almost arbitrarily so. Uh, yeah. Sure. So there are three renormalizable ones, exactly three, and there are only three. There's the vector portal, where you have uh, the, the, uh, either the photon or Z kinetically mixing with a Z prime in the hidden sector. Okay? There's also a Higgs portal, where you have a scalar in the hidden sector, which mixes with the standard model Higgs. And then there's also something called the lepton portal, which involves right-handed neutrinos and, and, and mixing between active and, 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 uh, and sterile neutrinos. So, and, and you can write down non-renormalizable ones with complicated UV completions, but with, with, those are the three simple ones. Okay, so um, direct detection rates are really suppressed. Production of colliders like the LAC is equally highly suppressed. The relic abundance is really easy to get. It works just as well as in the standard WIMP case. Okay? It doesn't work any less well or it's not any more complicated. And like I said, oh, just like, this, like I was saying, there are three easy, simple model building possibilities and some that are more complicated. But these three are all really easy to write down. If, you want to, uh, if you're a particle physicist, this is a Lagrangian for the, left, uh, the vector portal case. The point here is that this term allows uh, hypercharge to kinetically mix with the Z prime in the hidden sector. That's the sort of thing that works as long as this quantity epsilon is made to be small. Um, I'm running, I'm, I'm, I'm behind, so I'm going to skip this well-motivated variant and just go ahead. Okay. So I've just told you about a, a long list of ways that I can almost arbitrarily suppress the prospects for discovering particles in underground detectors or at the LAC, the dark matter particles. Um, this sounds like a good solution to the, the problem we're facing, but it also might be depressing. It might look like I'm saying, there's no chance that we're going to ever discover this stuff. And I don't want to give you that impression um, because I want to return to this list and take note of something. So I just wrote down six ways to avoid, evade um, both uh, collider constraints and direct detection constraints. But um, four of the six ideas I wrote down here have unsuppressed indirect detection rates. So these particles should annihilate with the same sort of power in, say, gamma rays and cosmic rays and stuff as the standard WIMP. And as I said before, we're currently testing the WIMP paradigm with indirect detection experiments. So if you have any it, it, options two, three, four, or six, um, you should expect indirect detection experiments to be very fruitful or even powerful uh, as ways to constrain these sorts of models. With that in, ma in mind, um, I'm going to spend the second half of the talk talking about my favorite uh, perspective signal of dark matter uh, that's been observed so far, the galactic center GEV access. So this is a bright 
in highly statistically significant signal of gamma rays uh, from the center of the Milky Way. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's quite difficult, although maybe not impossible, quite difficult to explain with known or understood astrophysics. Uh, but it does look a lot like what you would expect a generic WIMP to produce um, in, in terms of gamma rays. This is a, a very limited and short history. So I wrote some papers in 2009 and 10 identifying this originally with Lisa Goodenough. And then I did work with Tim Linden um, and later with uh, Tracy Slatcher and uh, Doug Finkbeiner and others here. Um, and some other groups, including the Irvine Group and uh, Canterbury Group and eventually Chloray, uh, Elise Cholis, and Chris, uh, Christoph Vinegar uh, had, had their own analysis. So these are just some of the early works on this. There are many, many other papers since. Um, this is not meant to be inclusive. So let me tell you a little bit about what we know about this signal. So the excess exhibits an approximate spherical symmetry. Um, it doesn't seem to be very elongated along the disk or perpendicular to the disk. It looks roughly spherical. Um, and the fl flux falls like the distance of the galactic center to the 2.4 power or so uh, in, in most of the fits, and it extends at least to 10 degrees or so in radius. Some of the fits say it goes to 20 degrees, some say 15, some say 10. Um, the, the fact is after 10, we can't be certain. There are some hints it goes out farther. Um, if we interpret this as annihilating dark matter, it tells you that the density profile in this part of the sky goes like the distance of the galactic center to the minus 1.2 power or so, um, which is pretty similar to the canonical NFW profile, just slightly steeper. Um, this is kind of what we expect dark matter to look like. Um, this, this, the stellar and other astrophysical things are, are not spherically symmetric, but we have every reason to think that the dark matter abundance will be approximately spherically symmetric in this part of the sky. The spectrum of the excess is pretty well fit by uh, roughly a 20 to 65 GV particle annihilating to quarks or, or gluons. Exactly the mass you need depends on what kinds of quarks or gluons. So for example, here, for, if you're annihilating to heavy quarks like BB bar, you expect the mass to be uh, you know, 45 or 50 GV or so. Um, it's also interesting to note that across the sky, you get the same shape of the excess. This is important because most astrophysical explanations don't predict this. If you're, if you're generating this by cosmic rays or by interactions with radiation or gas, you expect different parts to be harder or softer. But when you break the, the, the inner galaxy into different regions and look at the spectrum in each region, you find that you get the generally same shape, or at least within statistical error bars. So there seems to be a uniform spectral shape across the entire inner galaxy. Thirdly, the overall intensity of the excess agrees with the WIMP paradigm quite well. Uh, in addition, uh, if you want to get the uh, observed uh, uh, intensity in gamma rays, you want a cross section that's right around 10 to the minus 26 cubic centimeters. You'll recall that's the sort of number you need to generate the right abundance in the early universe. So if this, if this number were 100 times bigger or smaller, I would have been much less excited about this as a dark matter signal. The fact that this aligns so well with the WIMP miracle, as we call it, is suggestive for a dark matter interpretation. So the Fermi collaboration was, um, w w at least in terms of publications, was pretty quiet about this for a long time. Uh, most in the Fermi collaboration denied that the signal existed for many years. It was a frustrating time. But starting in 2015, they started, uh, uh, started uh, publicly discussing this in, in a more positive light. Uh, Simona Mergia's paper from 2015 is especially good. Um, I, I, it was, it was a, a watershed moment for the collaboration. And more recently, Ackerman et al. have this paper from last year. Um, this is from the Ackerman uh, uh, paper. The, the bottom line is they find the same access that we've been talking about for years. Although I think it's fair to say that they, they've considered many of the systematic uh, issues that we didn't. So after, after looking at a wide range of different uh, astrophysical models, they found that the excess persists across all of the models they could think of. Um, but it's also the case that the, the details of the spectral shape they extract depend on exactly what they assume about the, the treatment of point sources in the Fermi bubbles. In particular, you can see here that in different background models, you get quite different spectra at high energies. And then here you get quite different spectra at low energy. So you could imagine that there are big error bars, systematic error bars at both low and high energies. But in the middle, where the, the signal is most robust, that seems to exist, persist across all variants of the background models. 
All right, so everyone agrees that the excess exists, or at least I think all, all, all informed parties agree that it exists. Um, so then the debate becomes what generates these gamma rays. And in the literature, there are really three viable options that have been put forth. Um, dark matter, of course, is one of them. But people have also talked about the possibility that there have been a recent outburst or series of outbursts of cosmic ray activity from the galactic center. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today, not because it's impossible, but because these scenarios are really, really, really fine-tuned. You have to imagine that there were several different outbursts over the last several million years that injected huge quantities of electrons and that the spectrum that was being injected constantly changed so that the spectrum observed in all parts of the sky are the same today. You can do it, but it's extremely fine-tuned, so I'm not going to talk about it in, the, in, this, in this presentation. I will, however, talk about this second pop, uh, uh, hypothesis that the excess is generated not by dark matter, but by a large population of millisecond pulsars concentrated in the inner uh, kiloparsec or so of the galaxy. So if you ask me uh, much about pulsars 10 years ago, I, I could have maybe given you one or two facts about them. I didn't know much about them. I'm a particle physicist after all. I don't concern myself with, with, with astrophysics very often, but I've become something of an expert of pulsars uh, accidentally because they've, they've been such a bane to particle astrophysicists over the last 10 years or so. They've, they've turned out to be a background to almost everything we've been looking at. So I keep learning more and more about pulsars and especially millisecond pulsars. So let me give you like uh, an overall uh, background of what, what I'm talking about here. So pulsars are just neutron stars that are spinning very quickly. Um, gradually, their rotational kinetic energy gets converted into different kinds of radiation. Radio uh, pulses, for example, as well as gamma ray pulses. And we've recently discovered they also uh, emit a lot of energy in, in very high energy pairs that, that form these things called TV halos. Typical pulsars um, have periods on the order of about a second, typically, although there's quite a variation. Those are populated here. This is the period. That's one second. So this is the cluster I'm talking about. And then this is the time derivative of the period. Okay? Um, these guys evolve by moving along lines of constant magnetic field like this. Um, and they do so pretty quickly over millions of years. So if you take a, a young pulsar and wait 100 million years, you won't see it anymore. It will, it will, it will basically shut off and slow down and, and become dormant. Um, but uh, some of those, after they've slowed down and entered the pulsar graveyard, will either uh, accrete, start accreting matter from a companion or acquire a companion and start accreting matter and get spun up. And in the process of this, it will spend some time as a low-mass X-ray binary and then gradually become a millisecond pulsar. That puts them over here. So these are, this is an interesting part of the PP dot plane. First of all, they have millisecond periods, much, much faster spinning than uh, the normal young pulsars. But their magnetic fields are much lower. So instead of being 10 to the 12 Gauss, they might be 10 to the 8 or so Gauss. And it turns out that that combination makes them about equally bright. Uh, lines of constant brightness look like this. So they're about the same in terms of total brightness, but they're much, much longer lived. They evolve very, very slowly, and they can remain bright instead of millions for billions of years. And for that reason, it's plausible that over the course of the Milky Way's history, a large number of millisecond pulsars could have uh, uh, come to accumulate in the, in the center of the Milky Way. So there have been many, many papers arguing in favor and against pulsars as the explanation for the galactic center excess. I'm going to summarize what I think are the most interesting arguments on both sides of this. Um, there are others, but I think these are the key points. Um, the main reason people have been interested in pulsars as an explanation is that they're observed to generate a spectrum of gamma rays that's similar to that of the excess. Peaks at a couple of GV, it falls off on both sides. At least qualitatively, um, the spectrum that's observed from pulsars, millisecond and otherwise, is similar to that of the galactic center excess. And that's a good reason to think it might be responsible. On the other hand, the morphology, intensity, and spectrum of the excess are all completely compatible and, in fact, suggestive of a dark matter interpretation. I don't think that's controversial. I think this is a pretty good argument in favor of pulsars. Okay? Um, you know, uh, take that for what you will. I mean, I think dark matter exists, but I'm not sure that it exists in anything like the form we're talking about here. Um, so to be honest, this is, this is these are the two reasons that I think pulsars 
probably take precedence in a lot of people's uh, estimation of this, this debate. But pulsars have problems. Um, we don't see any bright gamma ray pulsars in the inner galaxy. And you would expect you should. If you put enough millisecond pulsars in the inner galaxy to generate the excess, and you imagine that the luminosity function of those pulsars is similar to that what you see in like the disk of the Milky Way or in the globular cluster population of the Milky Way, you should have seen a lot, maybe 30, 40, 50 of these by now. You don't see any. So that's a little surprising, maybe a lot surprising. And also, you don't see any of the low-mass X-ray binaries in the inner galaxy. Well, you see some. But you see about 10% about as many as you would have expected to see if you had that many pulsars there. So for all these reasons, I think uh, the, the, the pulsar interpretation is, is challenged. But then, a couple of years ago, there were these two papers that presented uh, what they call evidence of small-scale power in the, X-ray, in the excess uh, gamma ray emission from the inner galaxy. Um, and that has certainly elevated this hypothesis. So let me go through that a little bit. So this is in two, 2015, two different groups shown here, Lee Lasani, Safdie, Slatcher, Way, and Bartels and all, um, uh, both, both found reached approximately the same conclusion. Um, the GB scale photons from the direction of the inner galaxy seem to be more clustered in, in groups of a few than you would expect from smooth background models. They, um, and, the, and the fact that these are, 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 are kind of in a, distributed in a clumpy fashion suggests that uh, they, this may be indicative of an, of an unresolved point source population, like a thousand or so millisecond pulsars that are each generating less than one photon on average, but some are making three, four, five, six, seven photons, and, and that's what we're observing in the clumpiness of this, of this distribution. So let me walk you through what a typical analysis of this data might look like and what their analysis looks like uh, to reach this conclusion. So if you're doing a typical Fermi intergalaxy analysis, like the kind my collaborators have done and other groups have done, you sum a bunch of templates and see at each energy how the templates absorb the power. So these are spatial or morphological templates. You have one that has to do with the galactic diffuse emission. It tells you where the gas and cosmic rays are and things like this. One that has to do with the Fermi bubbles, which I haven't talked about in this talk, but they're another known feature to be present in the gamma ray data. Uh, one that has to do with the isotropic or extragalactic background. And then one that has to do with the dark matter annihilation. And then what the Lee et al. Lee et, Lee et al. Uh, uh, study does is they add on top of these smooth templates, they add non-Poissonian templates to account for an unresolved point source population. So they start with an isotropically distributed one. So, uh, so now in addition to these templates, there can be a clumpy but isotropically clumpy uh, template, uh, a, a population of clumps that are distributed uh, according to the disk of the Milky Way, and then a population of clumps that are distributed like you'd expect the excess template, the dark matter squared template to look like. And here's what they find. This is as a function of the brightness of each individual source. And this is like a, a counting of the number. And let me point at the main features here. This part is what their disk-like population of sources pick up. And you'll notice it goes through these error bars. These error bars are the actual sources in the Fermi catalog. That's where all the bright sources lie. So the bright sources look like they're distributed along the disk, okay? just like you'd expect. Okay, so the disk of the Milky Way contains pulsars and a bunch of other things. That's where they're picking up all of the disk-like power. That makes sense. But then they also, here, pick up a lot of power just below Fermi's detection threshold or around their detection threshold for uh, what looks like uh, the morphology of the galactic center excess. So the bottom line, what you can take away from this image is that they find that th this bump here suggests that a population of about 1,000 point sources right around Fermi's current threshold, current detection threshold, um, could potentially account for the galactic center excess. This bump looks like a whole bunch of near threshold sources that they're just starting to pull out of the data. All right, so it should be appreciated the millisecond pulsar populations that are observed elsewhere, namely in the disk of the Milky Way, and in the globular cluster population of Milky Way, don't look like these pulsars. So th these are examples of luminosity function models, these lines, these solid and dashed lines, right? They don't peak sharply 
at Fermi's detection threshold. So these are different. They don't have any of the bright members, and they peak sharply at one particular range of luminosities. Um, so I, I, I'm not saying this couldn't be pulsars, but I'm saying that if they are pulsars, they're a different kind of population than the pulsars we've seen anywhere else. That's a logical possibility, but it's not the simplest one. And more generically, or more generally speaking, it's difficult to tell whether these clustered uh, gamma rays, these groups of two, three, four, five, six photons that, that, that they're pulling out of the data, really do resolve, uh, result from unresolved point sources, or are instead the result of backgrounds that are a little less smooth than are currently being modeled in the analysis. So let me give you a cartoon to convey what I'm trying to convey here, or to communicate what I'm trying to get across. So this is some direction in the sky. It's really in 2D, but it's 1D in my, my, my cartoon. And this is the flux. Let's say you observe this solid, thick black line. And you say, well, this is what the backgrounds look like. They're smooth and well modeled. Then I do a subtraction of this, and I get this. Okay? So this is what the excess looks like. The fact that it's so uh, clumpy and so peaked tells you that's probably a bunch of point sources, and they're smearing into each other. Okay? But I could equally well interpret the same data, the same, th these lines are identical, um, in the following way. I could say, well, in fact, the backgrounds look like this uh, much more uh, uh, jaggedy line. Okay? So uh, this is a poor model, a, an over, uh, un unrealistically smooth model. This is a more realistic model. And then this is the dark matter signal that is smooth, like you'd expect. The data, as it stands, is completely consistent with both interpretations. There's nothing you can do with this data that I'm aware of that allow you to really tease these two scenarios apart. We should also keep in mind that these clusters of photons we're talking about are just a few photons each. And they're on top of much larger and quite imperfectly known backgrounds. And gamma ray point source identification is really difficult, especially in the galactic center region, even for very bright sources. And if you want to convince yourself this is true, take the three most recent catalogs that the Fermi Collaboration has put out, the three FGL catalog and the first and second inner galaxy catalogs, and just compare their membership. They don't overlap a lot. There are, cat there are sources in any one of these catalogs that are not in the others, and vice versa. <coughs> in fact, these two catalogs, which are supposed to be of the same region and are supposed to you know, be up to date and use this, a similar data set, contain only about half overlapping sources. The other half, uh, and they're both about the same size, but this, this catalog, about half of its members are not in this, and about half of these are not in that. That tells you that this is a very hard game, and you should take a lot of this with a grain of salt. All right, so um, I'm just going to briefly touch on the connection with low-mass X-ray binaries. Um, so when a uh, dead pulsar is being spun up into a millisecond pulsar. It spends a time, usually hundreds of millions of years, in the state of a low-mass X-ray binary. So it's hard to imagine that there would be uh, you know, tens of thousands of millisecond pulsars in the galactic center without there being a bunch of low-mass X-ray binaries as well. And those are much easier to detect. So we can use the LMXB population in the inner galaxy to inform us as to what we think the millisecond pulsar population might be. Um, because I'm, I'm a little short on time, I'm going to just kind of summarize that when you, when you do the exercise comparing globular clusters in the inner galaxy, we find that there are not nearly enough LMXBs in the inner galaxy to account for the millisecond pulsar population. It's about a factor of 10 off. Okay? So you could explain 10% of the signal with, with, this, with this picture, but not all of it. You should have seen 500 of these things, and you see something like 50. And then. Um, I just want to say that there have been some efforts to directly look for the gamma ray emission from these pulsars as resolved sources, to start to see these near threshold sources um, that, that uh, are being indicated uh, the weekly in, in, the, in, the, in these statistical analyses. In particular, the Fermi Collaboration put out this paper uh, about a year ago, you know, just, a, just shy of a year ago. And they claimed that they found seven sigma evidence for a large centrally located pulsar population. If this were true, I wouldn't be giving this talk today. Um, it, would, it would basically answer the question that, in fact, this is, the pulsars are responsible, and that would be the end of the game. Um, th it was a very strongly written abstract basically saying that, basically saying we've, we've found what makes a, the, the galactic center excess. 
But I looked at this a little more carefully, and eventually I brought in a pretty long list of collaborators. I brought them in one, in, one at a time, because I kept thinking I must have screwed something up. And it's like, can you check this for me? And they would, and they come back with my answer. And I said, well, we're probably both screwing something up. Maybe we can get a third person in. Pretty soon we wrote five independent codes to be absolutely sure we didn't screw anything up. When we all got this exactly the same answer, we put out the paper. When we did it, we tried to rep reproduce the result from the Fermi collaboration exactly. Tried to do exactly what they did. But instead of two sigma, we always got two sigma or less in favor of a central source component. And we could even make that go away really easily by the, the details of how we did the analysis. Um, and then we started talking with the Fermi collaboration. And uh, we, we uh, wrote up a paper and we were about to post it. And they said, oh, we found the bug in our code. Brackets should have been like this, but they were like this. And when they fixed that, they got our results. And they retracted the paper and put out a version 2 without any of these claims. We also did a, a, a complementary exercise in our paper. This is the same paper here. Um, and, and I think this is particularly telling. So what, what we're showing here is that we did the, the, the analysis to, to, to extract the spectrum of the excess in the standard way. Um, that's, I, I want to call this red. I'm colorblind, but I think that's red. And you get the spectrum, OK? And then we did the same thing, but putting a mask over every place that the Fermi collaboration said there was a pulsar candidate. Then we get. I'm going to call that blue. Okay, they're the same. Okay, what this tells you is that you know pulsars might be responsible for the excess, but the pulsar candidates that have been identified so far don't make up any substantial fraction at all. Maybe a few percent, but no more than that. The excess you're seeing here is not coming from any uh, resolved or even candidate pulsar source. Okay, so there's no correlation between where where they're finding candidates and where the excess is coming from. OK. So that's where things stand right now. And uh, I ask myself this question all the time, uh, what, what's next? Okay, we've identified a signal. Everyone agrees it's there. It's not easy to explain. Pulsars seem promising, but they've got a lot of problems. Then again, we don't really have any like, smoking gun telling us for sure it has to be dark matter. How do we go from establishing the presence of this intriguing signal to be able to claim discovery or rule out a dark matter interpretation. That's really what we want to do. And I think there are two particularly exciting ways forward. One is using these next generation radio telescopes. So we've never detected a radio millisecond pulsar, or a millisecond pulsar of any kind, actually, uh, from the inner galaxy. Um, but upcoming large area surveys, radio surveys, uh, using telescopes like Meerkat and SKA should detect dozens to hundreds of these millisecond pulsars if they're present. If they don't find them, it would be really telling that millisecond pulsars just really can't be responsible. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, it, it, probably in the very near future, the Meerkat observations, and then in the more distant future, the SKA. But I think this will be a, a very straightforward and powerful way to test the millisecond pulsar hypothesis. And next, I want to talk about core, um, the possibility of confirming uh, a dark matter interpretation using gamma ray observations of dwarf galaxies. So Fermi searches for dark matter and dwarfs have been going on for some time. They, they use a mixture of classical dwarfs and ultra faint dwarfs. Um, in the last few years, there have been a couple of dozen new dwarf galaxies, or at least candidates. Most of them will probably dwarfs, but a few of them probably won't be. They've been discovered mostly in the DES, or dark, dark energy survey data, but also with Sloan and uh, PanStars and Subaru. So you know, we're finding more dwarfs all the time. Uh, particularly exciting are the dwarfs Recticulum II, Tacana III, and Cetus II, which are all really nearby, and therefore really are very, very promising targets to look for dark matter annihilation, the kind of signal that would confirm independently a dark matter interpretation of the uh, galactic center. The current sensitivity uh, of, of these searches is right around the range we're interested in. So the galactic center tells you to look right around here. That's where the current constraints are. So we're, we're right in the hot spot right here. Um, so this is what I'm conveying. Here, here's, here's where we expect the signal to be. Um, this line here, not this one, the top line is the current constraint. It cuts through part of it, but it leaves a lot unexplored. If you can make the sensitivity two or three times more sensitive, you would expect to see the signal uh, pretty clearly. Uh, and for this reason, I think dwarf galaxies might be the final arbiter of the galactic center debate. So in 2015, three groups, one, I, I, my group and two others, 
uh, including uh, Savas uh, Kuchiapis and Gerger Samoth's group, who's here at Brown. Uh, we reported an excess from the newly discovered dwarf reticulum 2, uh, different groups on different numbers, but it's roughly a three sigma access, depending on exactly how you, how you perform your analysis. And more recently, Fermi has presented an updated analysis of 48 different dwarf galaxies. So we have a pretty, pretty sizable list now. And here are the summary of, of their results. I'm going to focus in on one and explain what this means. I'm going to focus in on this particular annihilation channel. Um, so what this is, is TS is test statistic. Um, if all the errors were distributed in a Gaussian way, the square root of the test statistic would be the significance in sigma. Okay? So this is a two sigma or three sigma sort of de de detection. Okay? And this is uh, the, as you vary the dark matter mass. You see a cluster of these all kind of peak right around here. That's kind of suggestive, right? It's really suggestive when you consider that that's the region that the, the spectrum of the galactic center excess tells you to favor. And it's furthermore even more suggestive when I point out that these two curves, the Tacana and Recticulum curves, are two of the most promising dwarfs, the ones that a priori we would expect to be the brightest in, the, in this. So you know, we're not really looking at all, all of these with equal weights. These are the two that are two of the ones we would expect to be the most promising. Um, and, and, and I don't want to get you too excited about this. This is only two sigma and change each. If you do some sort of stacked analysis of this, maybe you get the three sigma, if you, if you, depending on exactly your choices. So it's not anything conclusive. But imagine doubling or tripling this data set. That's where you really uh, could, could hope to, to uh, really settle this question once and for all in a, in, a, in a very exciting way. This is the plot I sometimes see in my happier nights of dreaming. I want to emphasize that this is not based on data in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I just made it up. I did it without any reference to reality. Um, but this is what it's meant to convey. This is what I could imagine we'd be looking at in 10 years or something. This axis is the J factor, which is a dynamical quantity that has to do with how much dark matter is in the system, how dense it is, and how close it is to us. The point is it's proportional to the predicted annihilation signal. These dwarfs, the dwarfs on this side, are, are, should be brighter in gamma rays than these. And then this is what I imagine you're, we're going to measure with either Fermi or the next generation gamma ray telescopes. And they should follow a linear relationship, one-to-one -one relationship. So if you started to find excesses that trace this line uh, as, as you discovered more of these dwarfs and measured them more and more precisely, measuring them both dynamically and in gamma rays, this would be something I don't think anyone would argue with. This would be a full smoking gun discovery of annihilating dark matter. All right, there are a few reasons, I think, that we should be optimistic about dwarfs, uh, to, be, to think that something like this could happen. Uh, first of all, we're going to have more data from Fermi. It's still taking data. It's been in, in, in orbit for uh, about 10 years now, or it will be 10 years this summer, I think. Uh, but there's no reason to think it will stop anytime soon. Uh, I hope it will collect another decade of data, although we we're not really sure. Um, there's also discussion these days about a, a future satellite gamma ray experiment. Uh, NASA is calling it Amigo, ESA is calling it Eastrogam, but something like this could happen that could really uh, improve these, the, the, this qu quite dramatically. Um, and looking forward, we're going to also have many more dwarf discoveries, not in gamma rays, but in, in optical. So DES has discovered all these dwarfs already. LSST will discover many, many more. Um, could be a couple hundred more. Could be dramatic. And, and, and uh, we just have many more places in the sky to point Fermi, and that will make it more powerful. And then thirdly, we don't really currently take into account a lot of multi-wavelength information. We calibrate uh, our backgrounds by pointing at what we call the blank sky and characterizing the blank sky and making statements about how often it is to get one, two, three, four you know, photons in a given bin. But if we use the multi-wavelength information, we can do this much, much better and increase the significance of these sorts of accesses. Uh, at least in principle. So that's, that's the sort of thing that I think is going to be left to the, to the next generation of people to do. But for all of these reasons, I expect uh, more power out of dwarf searches, enough to probably test the galactic center access hypothesis. All right, so thanks everyone for their attention. I'm going to summarize a couple of my main points first, and then uh, I'll be happy to take questions or chat with anyone who has other questions afterwards. So I've tried to convey that direct detection experiments have been remarkably successful over the past 15 years or so. 
um, improving in sensitivity at this amazing Moore's Law-like rate. Um, over the course of that time, they've ruled out many of our best or most well-motivated dark matter models. Um, and over the next decade or so, I'm expecting to rule out many other, or rule out or discover many other uh, very exciting models. It's, it's an exciting time and continues to be uh, for direct detection. The LAC has been fantastically successful in, in that it's uh, provided an amazingly comprehensive uh, view of the electroweak scale, the TEV scale. Discovered the Higgs boson, but still no other new physics. Um, I'm eagerly awaiting the, the day where we can, we, I can stop saying that, however, and talk about the, the new physics it has discovered. Uh, indirect searches using gamma rays and cosmic rays have been, have been very uh, successful, and they're currently testing uh, what I would call the, the, the WIMP paradigm, the range of annihilation cross-sections that are predicted for a generic thermal relic with masses up to, say, 100 GeV or so. Um, and collectively, direct, indirect, and LEC experiments are, are testing the WIMP paradigm. We have, to mean, we have to think about WIMPs, and we have to think about dark matter in a very different way today than we did 10 years ago. So the WIMP is certainly not dead. It's far from dead. Um, but the fact that we haven't seen it with these experiments so far has redirected the field and has led to an explosion in creative model building. I talked about some of those ideas today, um, but they're really just the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of different things that people are talking about and thinking about um, that I didn't have time to go into today. And then I think uh, the Galactic Center GVXS remains exciting and compelling. Um, certainly statistically significant, robust, extended, spherical, and diff difficult to explain with any known or proposed astrophysics. Future gamma ray observations of dwarf galaxies, as well as radio surveys of the inner galaxy, are going to provide critical tests um, that will ideally uh, thoroughly uh, uh, inform us as to the uh, origin of the signal. Thank you very much. <coughs> Dan, thank you very much. Um, questions? Greg. Uh, thanks for this talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is related to this uh, future of Fermi. Uh, for, many, for several years now, the DOE and NASA are talking about uh, shutting it down. And even if you find the money to keep the data flowing, just keeping something on the orbit for 20 years with all the gyro failing and the solar batteries failing uh, might be hard. Now, even if you do that, you only double the statistics, which is 40 percent uh, increase in significance. So that doesn't sound like a very... Uh, so we're not in the square root of time regime. We're in the time regime for dwarf galaxies. Um, these are still counting limited. So it really does in double the significance for a lot of the parameter space we're talking about here. Because you're looking at new places where new dwarf galaxies will be detected. Um, right? and, and like it, so if you're still in the Poisson regime, if you're looking in a bin and you see zero events, right. and you wait twice as long and see zero events, you've doubled your sensitivity. You haven't increased it by square to two, but by two. So, um, so we're in a more interesting regime than that. Um, and I, of course, agree. I mean, the gyroscopes or some other part of Fermi could fail any time. There's just a few weeks ago there was some problem that apparently got fixed, but we're holding our breath for a moment. Um, but I, I, you know, there's there's no reason to think it's gonna you know uh, fail tomorrow. It could, um, but um, it's kind of like your elderly grandmother. You you know she seems to be keep keep kicking, and you have no reason to think she's gonna be short for the world. So um, knock on wood. Uh, and the, um, the other question is, uh, so from the galactic excess, you know the uh, range of mass is pretty well, let's say, between 50 and 100 GB, within a factor of two. So uh, what would be the most um, uh, kind of obvious mediators uh, between the standard and the, what you call portal, between the standard model sector? And can you give some projection for, say, LHC? Because that's a typical range of masses where LHC is fairly powerful. I, I agree. Um, so I can, the, the, I can write down all sorts of things that would work um, in, that, in terms of model building. Um, so you can write down, so if you don't have a hidden sector, you're really forced to either having some sort of uh, spin zero mediator with pseudoscalar-like couplings. That's one option. Um, and then very specific kinds of Z primes you can write down. Um, and then their hidden sector models are also very easy. You just write down something where the dark matter annihilates either to, through the vector portal to a pair of, uh, of Z primes in the hidden sector or to a pair of uh, scalars in the Higgs portal. You know, those things are all, all work. Those are very hard to test with the LAC. The former uh, examples, uh, I think, are sorts of things that LAC can, can meaningfully test uh, and probably even rule out in, a, in a, its high luminosity run. Um, in terms of giving the LAC advice, 
Um, I, I just have no complaints. Uh, the, 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 the CMS and Atlas collaborations have been extremely exhaustive in, in, the, in the, the analyses they've chosen to conduct, um, which is not what I was pleasantly surprised to find out that would be the case. If you go back to the LEP days, there were all sorts of analyses that should have been done that weren't. Um, that's just not true anymore. Like uh, they, they, that, that uh, impedance mismatch between theory and experiment that existed 20 years ago doesn't seem to exist today. And I'm very happy about that. There seems to be a lot of communication between the theory and experimental communities, and that has led to uh, a lot of stones being uh, uh, turned that would, would not have been in the past. Um, Dan, you're probably more aware of it than I but recently there were some astrophysics uh, observations of um, the dwarf galaxy distributions around other spiral galaxies that suggested that there was a planar mm -hmm. distribution to the dwarfs, which is not uh, compatible with the standard uh, dark matter model. So I, I'm only limitedly informed, uh, my opinions on this are only limitedly informed. I, I will repeat some things that people who I, I have strong opinions and seem to know a lot about it have told me. Um, some argue that it might be a selection effect in the sense that uh, you're not sure what kind of coverage or what kind of completeness these observations uh, include. And if you really knew that stuff better, you'd find that it weren't quite as plain as you think. Uh, and also, I've been told that the statement that you know ordinary cold collisionless dark matter doesn't can't form planes is not necessarily correct, and that if you include uh, all the bells and whistles in your simulation routines, uh, you can you can find there are certain merger scenarios that will lead to that sort of behavior. Um, I, but again, I'm, I'm 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 citing authority, which is a terrible way to do science. But that that's what some people have have argued. Uh, that I've spoken to. Uh, hi, uh, I I think uh, I I want to I don't want to be pedantic, but I, like there was a plot that was conspicuously missing was the CMB constraints uh, on mm. on maybe I'm maybe you're in a model where I'm, where these don't exactly apply, but my understanding is that they always apply. CMB uh, on, from annihilation. Yeah, so th those apply to about 10 GV in lower masses uh, for, for S-wave annihilation models. Um, I'm just never talking about anything that light. OK, so, so uh, the 40 GV BB bar is still safe from Oh, CMB? that's perfectly safe. Yeah, okay. that, yeah that doesn't uh, come in any conflict with uh, Planck results. Right, and, and with the anti-protons, it's, it's very curious. You know, with the latest results from 2016 AMS, uh, it's slightly uh, iffy. But I guess, uh, like, because they have, like, a like a weird bump right around 20 GeV, if I remember correctly. Right. Uh, and, and so uh, has there been any update on, uh, on that? No, um, not that I'm aware of. Okay. And, and it's still not in a publication, right? People are just fitting what they show in plots. Right. Um, so yeah, we don't have a lot of information to go on. But could that potentially be a robust constraint on, uh, on the GeV uh, excess candidates? So I'll tell you what is currently making it hard to make the, use the antiproton data robustly. Um, so if you want to calculate the backgrounds for cosmic ray antiproton searches, you need to know the differential cross-section for the, the production of antiprotons in ordinary cosmic ray interactions. This is a proton-proton collision, right? We don't know it. Uh, the error bars are huge. It's never been carefully measured in a laboratory. So if we built a low, modest energy accelerator with a fixed target and just carefully, with, with precision, measured the, the different, this differential antiproton production cross-section, you can improve the power of this $3 billion cosmic ray experiment by a, a great deal. Um, I think it's, it's imperative that we do that. searches. Um, you've just touched on this, but maybe you'd like to expand a bit. Obviously, we are potentially in competition when looking for the annihilation signal with some, I don't know whether you call them foregrounds or backgrounds, but other sources of gamma ray. 
uh, you know, quite possibly with the, you know, the same point-like structure that we expect from the dwarfs. Do you, I've had some people express, you know, that it may be difficult for us to push sensitivity in indirect searches because of, uh, because of those potential signals. Well, so the main background to these dwarf searches are unresolved extragalactic sources, like blazars, okay? So, so faint or distant blazars that just happen by chance to lie behind a, a given dwarf. And if you only had one dwarf, okay, then this would be something you'd worry about forever. Because no matter what excess you saw, you'd always wonder, well, there's some chance, you know, 1%, 0.1%, whatever, that there's that source just happens to lie behind it. But now you have this plot. This doesn't happen from that. This is just would be too staggering of a coincidence that those, those chance alignments happen to fall all along this line. That, that would settle the debate. So this is what you need to accomplish. And the, the dwarfs that are left as it were to be discovered, what, what are the chances they actually lie further to the right on this plot? Good. There are good chances. Good chances. Um, really? So I'll just point out that of the, uh, of, the ones, uh, of the most promising ones we have now, most of them were discovered by DES. Yeah. And that means if they were in the northern hemisphere, we wouldn't know about them yet. In the LS LSST, should, we have every reason to think we'll discover several like that, maybe, <laughs> maybe a dozen, who knows. You know? um, so the, the, the prospects are good in that sense. Inspiration? Oh, uh, can we thank our speaker again? Thank you.